the internet in China. It's a high-tech dystopia, and officials from around the world are going to China to learn how to build their own internet dystopias. Welcome back to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Internet censorship in China today has reached absurd levels. People have been jailed for the things they say on WeChat. Here's a quick list of some of the things censored on the Chinese internet. Tiananmen Square Massacre, an empty chair, Winnie the Pooh, and even the letter N. That must make the Chinese version of Sesame Street so difficult. But to find out exactly how bizarre the internet censorship in China is, I sat down with Sarah Cook. She's a senior research analyst and director of the China Media Bulletin for Freedom House, an NGO focused on research and advocacy for democracy, political freedom, and human rights. Thank you for joining us today, Sarah. My pleasure. So how bad is internet censorship in China? Well, to be honest, the Chinese Communist Party has created the most multifaceted and sophisticated system of internet censorship in the world. And actually in Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report, uh, for like the last three years, China has been designated as the worst abuser of internet. It's like worse of internet than, freedom. Worse than Syria? Yeah, I mean, I think it's different factors. So it's worse uh -huh. than Syria and Iran. I think it's a different d dynamic in terms of what the political situation in these countries are. Um, I mean, in Syria, it might be that you don't have internet access because you know something's been bombed out. Mm -hmm. In China, there's quite a good amount of actual access to the internet, and it's increased. But the extent to which people are able to actually do certain things on the internet and the scale of controls that are exercised, that are in, in, in place, even if they're not always activated and exercised, uh, is tremendous. It goes through the entire internet system in China, and it's by far the most uh, sophisticated and pervasive of anywhere else in the world. So I know a lot of people sort of make the mistake of thinking of internet censorship as like the government preventing certain information from getting out there. But a big part of it is actually pushing a message the government wants. What is the message the Communist Party is pushing? Well, it depends, really. Mm -hmm. It depends on the topic, and it depends on the audience in some ways. Um, uh, you know, you have the kind of set forms, uh, set taboo topic. So, you know, not letting people know about June, June 4th or about Falun Gong or about mm -hmm. uh, Taiwanese the Tiananmen Square, Square Massacre. Massacre. Yeah, the, yeah, the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Mm -hmm. um, or about what's really happening to Uyghurs and Tibetans in different parts of China. Mm -hmm. um, but part of that is also manipulating the message. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it, it's this combination of censorship and propaganda that are really two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of it is suppressing the bad news and then the part of it is promoting the good news. And actually, like Xi Jinping talks about promoting like positive. The China story. The positive right? story. Well, the China story, that's more outside of China. Telling a good China story, that's mm -hmm. more outside of China. Okay. Within China, they wanted to you know, promote like positivity. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and just to give an example, like just the extremes to which they go to do that, you know, like you see from leaked censorship directives that they will tell websites that, let's say, the landing page of like a Google News type of website, has the, the top story has to be this. And mm. in some cases, I think there's a sense that the rankings on social media platforms of like what's the hottest news now is manipulated. Last year, when I think it was last year when the constitutional was changed to basically enable Xi Jinping to become president for life, mm -hmm. if you looked at like the top ranking topics on social media, it was like how to eat noodles on a high speed train. <laughs> This is inside China. This is inside China. These okay. are on platforms that are China, run by Chinese companies, and so okay, it's so not necessarily like like Google. This is like Chinese. Yeah, these searches. are Chinese. This is Chinese social okay. media. This is Weibo, yeah. and Sina Weibo, and uh, WeChat. So it's yeah, these are Chinese because the Chinese government uses the Great Firewall to block uh, mm -hmm. the kinds of social media applications that we all use, Facebook, Twitter. Those aren't really accessible to people in China unless they have a way of jumping the firewall. But within China, then you have these kind of Chinese alternatives that become extremely popular. And they have whole departments of staff whose job is basically to identify and censor content. And then in some cases, based on instructions specifically to promote other content. Wow. So when Xi Jinping became president for life, the main story was how to eat noodles? That was like one of the top ranking stories on Weibo because they had censored so much, because it's a combination, right? Mm -hmm. It's because they had censored so much of the keywords and the conversations that Chinese people were trying to have mm -hmm. about this like important news topic. Um, 
And, and so you didn't have that trending. And then I think we, we suppose that there was some kind of manipulation of the trending as well. So this kind of ties into the whole patriotic education as well. Well, patriotic education is a term that's usually specifically used in Tibet. But in general, there's like a type of just, yeah, generally kind of nationalistic education, um, mm -hmm. you know, very pro-communist party. And then it's not just that, like especially under Xi Jinping, it's like mm -hmm. promoting Xi Jinping thought per se. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and certain like tenets of Xi Jinping thought and referring to him as like the core leader. That's where under Xi especially there's a little bit of a sense of like a personality cult that you didn't necessarily see earlier. Okay. So in the West, sort of the original model, the internet was that it was free and open. China is offering an alternative model to the internet. What is the China internet model? Well, the Chinese government would say it's a form of cyber sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that the internet does not cross borders. It's that the internet really stops at the border and you create a certain board, a virtual border. And in China, it's the case of the Great Firewall. But it's also elements of, of, of various laws like the cybersecurity law and requiring data centers to, to have the certain, you know, to be. Uh, applications or things like iCloud to have its servers inside China and not be able to be outside of China. So that whatever happens within China is really under the Communist Party's control. And there's multiple ways in which that's done, either technologically or also legally and administratively. But that's in a lot of ways the, the model. And it's a combination of this kind of high-tech techno dystopia mm -hmm. um, that, that is maybe less achievable for other countries, depending on their, their, their technological caliber and, 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 and resources, monetary resources. Um, but it is also a, you know, a different model that, re that, that is maybe easier to mimic in sort of specific kinds of legislation, arresting bloggers, sentencing them to prison, you know, arresting, um, uh, forcing uh, local me uh, social media companies to do their own censorship, um, and, and then injecting this type of kind of proactive manipulation of paid government commentators or other forms of what you know the Chinese party calls kind of gaining the upper hand in terms of quote guiding public opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's all of those factors combined but ultimately it's this idea that within China's borders particularly within a particular country's borders you should have full control over what people can see and do on the internet and not allow these companies outside like Facebook or Twitter or others to to be able to, or the New York Times, to produce information that your people can read and see. Mm -hmm. So if you look at China's model of internet controls, it's not just censorship, which we think of a lot. Um, it's a combination of, of censorship, but also extensive and pervasive surveillance and monitoring of what people are doing online. Real name registration, so they can that's how they can arrest people, because they can trace that this person who has a seemingly anonymous mm -hmm. account is actually belongs to this particular individual. You can't internet. be anonymous on the Chinese mm -hmm. internet. And increasingly, with people who are on Twitter, they're not anonymous on Twitter. Somehow the Chinese government is figuring out ways to trace it back, the Twitter account back to their phone number and they're getting a knock at the wow. door for what they're writing on Twitter. Even though Twitter is banned in China. Even though Twitter is banned in China, people are jumping the firewall. It's open and they're most, and in some cases it's people who have like 3,000 followers. I mean, not people with millions of followers yeah. necessarily, but they're getting knocks at the door in some cases just for opening an account or, or things like that and they're being, being um, so that's, you know, they're uh -huh. being harassed. And so that's an even arrest. Yeah. I just need to make sure that's not happening to the good people of the People's Daily Twitter account. Right? No, of course not. Right. That's, so that's, that's the thing. Good. That's the, so there was actually, I think, a relatively recent case of some employee of Chinese state media uh -huh. getting in trouble for creating a, twi a personal Twitter account. When you have Chinese state media like Xinhua and People's Daily and China Daily they and CGTN, they all have with millions of followers and they're able to access, you know, million, talk to millions of people around the world. But if you're, you know, a Chinese human rights lawyer, a professor. Or even an individual employee of those state oh, I mean, companies. Yes, and then, then your people are starting to get in trouble. And that's something very new. A year ago, that wasn't mm -hmm. happening. That's something relatively recent. Um, so you've got a combination of censorship, of surveillance, and of intimidation and harassment, um, and all of and, and this kind of proactive manipulation um, that all of it together creates um, uh, a very interesting environment in China. Because on the one hand, you have a lot of information that's censored and that's inaccessible. But there's still a vibrancy about it and all kinds of things that, you know, if you think about what you do with your phone, yes, you check the New York Times, you check news that would probably be censored in China. You also look up what movie is playing nearby. You use Google to Google Maps to go and try to navigate how to get to your friend's house. You look up what the ranking is on this particular restaurant. All of those types of things are accessible in China, although they're with Chinese apps and not the ones that we would usually use. Um, but uh, so, so it's kind of this illusion of choice that's created. Mm -hmm. Where the Chinese government 
can control everything. It doesn't necessarily, and this space is shrinking, but it's created a system where it could control everything if it wants, and it's able to nitpick and pull out and censor the things it doesn't want people talking about. So what happens to people inside of China who get on the wrong side of the internet censors? Um, well, it depends. You can, it can range from having a particular post be deleted to having your entire account be canceled. So there's lots of examples of on these kind of parallel social media applications in China run by Chinese companies, people with millions of followers. Just like that, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Press the button, it's gone, all gone. And in some cases that has real impact on their livelihood too because people will earn money because they're a you know, famous author or whatever, and yeah. celebrity. So, so it can range from, you know, from those types of, of, of examples of, of losing, uh, having a post deleted, having your account canceled, um, all the way through to being sentenced to, to prison. Um, in some cases, to very long prison terms, 10 years, 15 years, um, a very, very long, long prison terms. So if I were making China uncensored inside of China, what would happen? To me? Uh, a few things would happen. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, you would really have no way of distributing it. <laughs> <laughs> so you would try to open, if you tried to open an account on one of the Chinese social media, either they wouldn't let you or very quickly after they saw what you were sharing, they would just delete it and that would be the end of that. Um, you would try to open a website and you wouldn't be able to. And then you would be under liability, you know, potentially personally, uh, especially if you create an episode where you were, say, mocking Xi Jinping. Which I would well, never do. Which you would never do because China and Sanders doesn't do any mockery of, of Chinese no. officials or the Communist Party. Um, or, or so, uh, so, so then you would potentially be liable to being arrested, getting a knock on your door in the middle of the night and be taken away and then be jailed and you know, have a trial that lasts for half an hour and not being able to access a lawyer and then you know, however long, you, and they'll have all the so-called evidence. Um, but we've actually seen that. We've seen people who just posted things um, making just humorous. There's a lot of people in China who have gotten in trouble for posting humorous things. A lot, the, the memes about Xi Jinping and yes. the Pooh. Yes, so for example, those, I don't know anybody who's actually been sent, jailed for sharing or posting a meme related to Xi Jinping and the Pooh, but certainly heavily censored. Mm -hmm. And there have been other people who have, you know, posted something that was a different kind of a mockery of Xi mm -hmm. who have been sent to administrative detention, or I think in one case even sentenced to like two years in prison. Now, this internet model that China is creating, they are trying to export that around the world, right? I mean, that's got to be appealing to other authoritarian regimes. Yes, and I would say not always even just authoritarians uh -huh. per se, but um, I think what we've seen over time is that there were already elements, even without uh, deliberate projection and export from China, that were being adopted by other regimes like Iran or Vietnam. Um, and then I think what we've seen in the last two years is that the Communist Party has actually been much more explicit about wanting to promote their model um, mm -hmm. and make their model not only for other countries but even trying to set sta international standards. And that gets into more technological stuff, but that relates, say, for example, to 5G standards and others so that their standards become adopted elsewhere and even become, they even use words like the consensus internationally. That's creepy. But, yes, but, but the... Um, but yes, yeah, so you definitely, but now I think more actively you have efforts to, uh, to, to promote uh, the China model. Uh, in some cases, it's in terms of the export of technologies. Um, in a lot of cases, it's a different. It's, it's more about other kinds of know-how. So mm -hmm. one of the things we found with the latest issue of Freedom on the Net was that we looked at how many countries had sent officials to China to have some kind of training related to new media or so-called information management. And actually we found that out of the 65 countries, 36 had sent officials. And that included places like Thailand or Vietnam, say, who have very uh, heavy uh, internet restrictions, but also places like the Philippines, for example, that, that doesn't, or, or parts of, uh, I think, even Latin American countries that have a fairly open internet, and they were sending mm -hmm. officials there for, for some kind of a training. Any European countries? or I don't remember the specific okay. list of countries. I would be surprised, because one of the reasons that people also go on this is also because it's kind of a nice all-expenses-paid all junket to China. And that's, so that can be attractive for, for, you know, some random Filipino official in the Ministry of Communication. Yeah. So this technology didn't come out of thin air. How did Western tech companies help build this system? So in some cases, it was 
pretty direct. Like we have reason to believe that Cisco, for example, had uh, played a role in helping the Chinese government build the Great Firewall and other aspects of what's called Golden Shield, which is a system of internet censorship and surveillance. Um, but at the same time, you also have, I would say, indirect examples where from even seemingly innocuous academic exchanges and things like that, or other types of joint venture partnerships, there was a certain degree of know-how that was transferred to Chinese companies or Chinese tech um, geniuses, <laughs> and, and those people were then, you know, applied it to uh, systems that, that are actually used to suppress uh, internet freedom in China. Um, so that you see a little bit with certain things now coming out about artificial intelligence and the like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you see that in terms of actually developing the system. Yeah. So besides the kind of structural elements uh, on a more micro level, you have Western companies who do uh, engage in censorship for Chinese users. So for example, Apple uh, has deleted apps from Chinese mobile app stores. And that includes specific news websites like NTD TV or news apps or the New York Times. But it also um, has deleted and removed hundreds of the kinds of applications that let people jump the firewall and access uncensored news. Um, and then you have, for example, LinkedIn that does some level of censorship uh, for people in China in terms of what profiles they're able to, to see. Um, so you definitely have also ways in which Western companies, when they're dealing with content, have to censor on behalf of the Chinese government. So it's very disturbing to hear that like companies like Microsoft or Google are, are like doing research with Chinese military universities that that technology might be used in Xinjiang for mass surveillance. Do you think there's any possibility that this kind of censorship will be exported to like a country like the United States? Like for instance, I know Mark Zuckerberg has talked about uh, wanting more control mm. over the internet. Mm. Um, well, I think in some ways we see certain forms of Chinese censorship already coming to the West. Um, and that takes the form in some cases of self-censorship by companies um, like airlines who aren't going to put Taiwan in the drop-down menu because they came under Chinese pressure. Um, or a case, I think it was Mercedes-Benz, where they had a post on a social media website, I think it was Instagram, that was outside China, not accessible to any Chinese people, and it quoted the Dalai Lama, and the Chinese government got upset, and then they actually like deleted it. And I think I issued a, you know, this very official kind of official apology. Up, uh, yes, official apology. So I think you see that kind of censorship um, slowly sneaking into the mm -hmm. West. But the other thing is that you have a Chinese company called Tencent that once runs an instant messaging application called WeChat, and it's used a lot by people in the Chinese diaspora, and including Americans, Canadians, mm -hmm. Chinese Americans, Chinese Canadians. Because it's a way to communicate with because people it's a way back to in China. People back in China, and they're just used to it. If they come yeah. out, they're used to it, and that's how they, you know, they'll keep in touch with people here. And so you're actually starting to see examples of censorship of people here by WeChat, including in some cases mm -hmm. communication between politicians and their constituents, or between local news media in Chinese in Australia, um, and how much they're actually, there's like almost no reporting that's critical of China in a way that's very different than what's on their main website. Mm -hmm. So you actually start to see that type, especially for the Chinese diaspora, start to see that sneaking into to, to the West, and it can have a real political impact in terms of political candidacies. For example, I don't know that China uncensored, I don't know if you've tried. I'm kind of doubtful that you would be able to create a WeChat account for, you know. That's and, a good idea. And so, <laughs> you know, you might not, you could test that out. You might not be able to then reach certain constituencies in the mm. United States, even though they're in America, you're in America. Mm. And so you see that element starting to infiltrate into the, into the West and, and with, you know, with, with, with some level of political ramifications, too. Um, and then in terms of surveillance, absolutely. I mean, there was recently a report, I think, that it came out that Hikvision, one of these Chinese companies that include, run surveillance in Cham China, including these facial recognition cameras in Xinjiang, uh, had gotten a contract for the UK Parliament. And it wasn't just for the UK Parliament, I think it was like some of the building with some of their offices. So there was suddenly concern, I think it might have been put on hold now, because there was suddenly concern about the really the national security implications of mm. this. So I think it's really more that element of the surveillance and this kind of backdoor concerns, mm -hmm. uh, rather than censorship uh, per se, uh, that you see from some of these Chinese technologies. But when you get to questions of uh, Chinese technology being involved in the delivery of content, you see that more in Africa now, that's where you do start to see censorship because they'll favor Chinese state media channels over, say, the BBC, BBC World in terms of like the most affordable package. So then you have fewer um, Africans who are watching BBC World and more who are watching Chinese state media. Mm. 
And you could see that happening in the West, but I don't know that's going to happen. Okay. So basically, right now, it seems like there's a battle going on between sort of the West's free and open internet model and China's sovereignty-based model. What will it take for the free and open model to win? Um, well, it's tricky because one of the problems and I think challenges that we're having is that there are a lot of people, even in democracies, that are questioning the desirability of having as free and open an internet as we have. And that's where you get to questions of regulating Facebook and other social media companies. So I, I think the first thing is really for democracies to, to give better, more attention to uh, and, and thought to how do you maintain the open uh, internet. Um, how do you protect freedom of expression and privacy within their own borders so that there is a more robust model? And how do you protect against encroachments um, from, from the Chinese model, including into our own societies? So, for example, starting out with, you know, really looking at WeChat in the United States or in other democracies and making sure in situations where they're violating the First Amendment rights of, of people here, that there's some kind of repercussion, that they have to, you know, the Chinese government, when they ask foreign companies to censor in China, they like to say, well, the companies like to justify, well, we're working according to local laws. Well, that should really work both ways. The, the Tencent should be following local laws here, and they should be allowing Chinese Americans and Chinese Canadians and, and Chinese Australians to have a free, open channels of communication on WeChat. Amen. And if not, then they should be fined or should, you know, be sued or something like that, like any company, other company would be. So I, I think that those are a few of the things in terms of really making sure that we're protecting our systems against Chinese government encroachment and, chi and, and you know, private company encroachment um, and, and creating a, a more robust uh, system uh, of protecting internet freedom at home. And then I think finding ways to support Chinese people's, you know, um, desire for, for a free internet, because there are a lot of Chinese people who would like a free internet. Uh, we see that when we publish a China Media Bowl and we hear from our readers and when we work with people who are, you know, circumvention tools to reach people in China. There are millions, we estimated there were 20 to 30 million Chinese people who used various tools to jump the firewall in 2018 to access uncensored information. Now, in a country of one point whatever billion, that's not a lot, but it could probably be a lot more. And there's certainly a constituency that is interested. And the more people learn about how censorship worked and how partial their information environment is, we've found in our surveys and from academic studies, the more likely they are to want to seek out uncensored information. So there's still a lot more to be done in terms of having Chinese people uh, be granted greater access to a free and open internet. Mm. So the Chinese people might be the biggest market for free and open internet. Yes, and actually I think it's really unfortunate that companies like Facebook or Google are investing in developing ways of trying to get into the Chinese market and have like a censored search engine like Dragonfly rather than imagine if all that money was invested in, in either supporting existing circumvention tools or designing some other type of tools that would allow Chinese people to access the internet freely because ultimately these companies would benefit. They make their money off of users. Like they don't, it doesn't have to be the Chinese government that grants American tech companies you know, access to the holy grail of the Chinese mm. internet market. They could be taking a piece of the pie themselves just by getting more people out of the firewall. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was, that was incredibly enlightening. Sure, I'm glad. Thanks for having me.